أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي ربنا زدنا علما اللهم فقهنا في الدين إلهي آمين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته I welcome all of you to our Ramadan series 2024 and today inshallah we'll be covering just number 27 so let's begin um, last time we covered Surah Qaf, and Surah Qaf was a Makki Surah, so Alhamdulillah, a lot of emphasis was on the day of Qiyamah, preparing for it, and holding on to Tawheed. So inshallah, we are going to continue with the next Surah. Before we do that, just a quick overview of just 27, this juice is going to have Surah Thariya, um, Surah Dhariyad, the remaining portion of it, Surah Tur, Surah Najm, Surah Qamar, Surah Rahman, Waqi'ah, and Surah Hadid. So lots of surahs, subhanAllah, six Makki surahs and one Madani surah. So inshallah, we have lots to cover. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give barakah in our time. So let's begin. A'udhu billahi minash shaitan ar-rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts off the surah by saying, وَالذَّارِيَاتِ ذَرْوَى فَالْحَامِلَاتِ وِقْرَى by the spreaders spreading and those carrying loads and those moving gently. So what is this talking about? It's basically talking about the winds. Adhariyat implies the winds that dispersed and missed up the, uh, the dust. So in this surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes an oath by the winds that lift up millions of tons of water vapors from the oceans in the form of clouds. All these oaths are taken to emphasize that the day of Qiyamah will definitely take place. And why is this the topic of the surah? Because it is a Makki surah and it was revealed to the Prophet ﷺ in the early phase of prophetic da'wah in Mecca. Uh, when the Prophet ﷺ was being ridiculed and, and opposed, yet the persecution had not started. So the main claim of the people of Mecca was that they denied resurrection. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is taking oath in order to prove to them that resurrection is haq and that's something that shouldn't be denied because that's definitely going to take place. In ayah number 15 and 19, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions to us about the sincere believers, that these people, they are not time wasters, they know the value of time, so what do they do? They deprive themselves from sleep, because they are busy doing qiyam, they adorn their nights with qiyamul layl. Whether it's Tarawih in Ramadan or it's the Hajjud at other times, they adorn their nights with Salah. Also, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala highlights to us that they deprive themselves from food during the day because they are fasting. So they adorn their day with fasting. And uh, subhanAllah, this is something we are doing today, but... SubhanAllah, after Ramadan, let's continue this habit, inshallah, and try to do whatever we can, inshallah, how much we can fast, how much we can pray Qiyam al-Layl, inshallah, we should follow this legacy, inshallah, and not give it up till the next Ramadan. And also, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala highlights to us that in their wealth, they have a share for the poor and the needy. So even in terms of our money, we should always remember the people who are less fortunate than us. So moving on to the next passage, now the surah is going to mention to us some of the destroyed nations. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions to us about the people of Saddam and Gomorrah. And this is basically where um, just 27 starts off with. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala highlights to us the story of Ibrahim alayhi salam, the time when the angels came to inform him about the fate of his nephew, uh, Lut alayhi salam's nation. So this is what the passage is talking about. So far, we didn't get a chance to do a detailed narrative about the legacy of Lut alayhi salam. So inshallah, let's take the opportunity and do it right now. Lut alayhi salam was a nephew of Ibrahim alayhi salam. So basically, when Ibrahim alayhi salam gave da'wah, 
in Iraq, no one accepted his message. Even his own father plotted to throw him in the fire. However, the only person who accepted the message of Ibrahim was his nephew Dut. So both of them, they were the only two Muslims at that time. So they migrated to Palestine once their people kicked them out of the city. And that's when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave a prophethood to Lut alayhi salam and chose him to be the messenger for the people of Saddam. So in terms of city, these people, the people of Saddam and Gomorrah were a thriving city, subhanAllah, that was visited by many travelers, merchants, and businessmen for trade. However, these people were also the most morally corrupt city with the highest criminal activity. So what was the crime of that nation? So even though they were successful people, subhanAllah, they had wealth, civilization, yet they would forcibly rob people, murder the innocent, and they practiced something that was never practiced in humanity, the act of homosexuality. So men would feel inclined towards men. And this was something haram. And that's the reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent Lut alayhi salam to guide them and bring them back to the true teachings of Islam. So Lut alayhi salam stayed in this place for years and years, inviting people to Tawheed, asking them, subhanAllah, to shun this sinful life and follow the path of the righteous. However, unfortunately, not a single person embraced the faith of Lut alayhi salam. Not even a single person. Imagine that. And that's when Lut alayhi salam made dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala after he faced a lot of persecution, mockery, ridicule from his community. And Quran highlights that multiple places, um, subhanAllah, in different surahs, how they harassed their prophet Lut alayhi salam. So after a lot of relentless effort, um, that's when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent angels to inform Lut alayhi salam that the time has come for this nation to be punished and destroyed. So three angels disguised in the form of handsome men came to the house of Lut alayhi salam to inform about the plan of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. However, the wife of Lut alayhi salam she was unaware of the fact that these are angels. She quickly went to her neighbors and the people of her city and informed them that there are good looking, handsome young men in our house who have come to visit my husband. So why don't you check them out? They are very good looking. So basically, she broke her husband's trust by sympathizing with her nation, by promoting this evil act. And this teaches us that in no way, shape or form, we can promote the sin and we cannot promote the sinful life. Subhanallah. So because she betrayed her husband's trust, subhanallah, when the punishment came down upon the people, the nation was destroyed. Yes, but even the wife of Lut alayhi salam was destroyed. Imagine that living in the company of your prophet did not ben benefit her at all. Subhanallah. She was destroyed. And the punishment that was sent to the people of Lut alayhi salam was a very unique and painful punishment. Basically, three types of punishment were combined together. So after Lut alayhi salam and his two daughters left the place, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent a terrible scream, a loud now a noise towards them. So basically, they were harmed with noise pollution. And then on top of that, there was a rain of baked clay, such that each stone was marked with names, who was it meant to hit and destroy. And then Angel Jibreel was commanded to take the entire city with the tip of his wing and flip it over. SubhanAllah. So after this, um, Lut alayhi salam migrated and he went to another land 
However, the current area where the punishment actually took place is marked today by the Dead Sea, subhanAllah. And this acts as a reminder of the wrath of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala against the people of Prophet Lut alayhi salam. And subhanAllah, when we look at the Dead Sea, we come to know from research that subhanAllah, German archaeologist Warner Keller says about the Dead Sea that this area belonged to the people of Saddam and Gomorrah, but plunged into destruction one day, and their destruction came from earthquake accompanied by explosions, lightning, and issue of natural gas. So something that came into discovery recently, but subhanAllah, the Quran informs us 1400 years ago that this was their fate. And even in terms of the Dead Sea, what do we learn? That it has a huge salt content. Its dense density being 30% of salt. So no form of life can survive there. Namely, no fish, seaweed, or plants can survive in that water because it's 8.6% saltier than, than ocean water. So subhanAllah, this was their fate and even though their nation was um faced with destruction and the wife of Lut alayhi salam died however Lut alayhi salam with his daughters migrated to another land and Lut alayhi salam died at the age of 175 when he was 175 years old now when it comes to homosexuality. Unfortunately, the irony of today is that this is a sin which is very rampant, subhanAllah. So the question is, what's the Islamic perspective on this issue? We should remember that homosexuality is definitely prohibited in Islam by all means, by all consensus, just like Islam doesn't allow us to commit adultery or fornication. Just like Islam doesn't allow us to touch non-mahram with lust or without lust. Just like Islam doesn't allow consumption of intoxicants, eating usury, or usurping the rights of others. Just like that, homosexuality is haram as well. Why is that so? Because the gays and the lesbians, they both go against the natural disposition, fitra, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created mankind with. And this fitra is also in animals because this fitra suggests to us that a male is inclined towards the female and vice versa. So this is sin that has to be avoided by all means. The Prophet wasallam said, there is nothing I fear for my ummah more than the deed of the people of Lut. So subhanAllah, the point to note over here is that desires are not sinful. So what if a sinful thought comes to um, your mind? This is not something sinful because people should not be identified or ostracized by desires as soon as an evil thought comes to mind what does islam teach us whether it's homosexuality whether it's adultery whether it's fornication as soon as an evil thought comes to mind allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaches us that we should seek refuge in allah we should seek refuge in Allah against the temptations of shaitan and submit our will to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As long as we do not act upon these evil desires, then our staying away from the haram for the sake of Allah is actually going to be rewarded. It's actually going to be rewarded. SubhanAllah. So in terms of treatment, we have no right to condemn anyone based upon their um, lifestyle or belief or orientation rather we should follow the prophetic way preach them with wisdom and make dua for them may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide the people who are committing um subhanallah 
kaba'ir, major sins, and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to keep us and our children and our progeny and all our generations firm upon iman such that we do not go towards what is prohibited in Islam, what has been made haram for us, inshallah. So with that said, we move on to the next um, mention in the surah. And the next mention in the surah is about the nation of Ad who were destroyed with wind. So we mentioned about Dariyat, winds. This was a nation who was destroyed with wind. So what is their story? What actually happened to them? We come to know that this was the nation, the nation of Ad, to whom Prophet Hud alayhi salam was sent. So basically, Hud alayhi salam is from the fifth generation of Nuh alayhi salam. When the flood actually took place in the lifetime of Nuh alayhi salam, he and his three sons and few followers, few Muslims, were saved from the flood. So once the flood subsided, they started a new life. Because one of the sons of Nuh alayhi salam died as a non-believer in the flood. So the three sons who accepted Islam, followed the legacy of their father, Nuh alayhi salam. One of the sons' name was Sam. So Hud alayhi salam is from the descendants of Sam, the son of Nuh alayhi salam. So basically, the nation of Ad and Samud are known as pure Arabs, and they spoke Arabic language. So Hud alayhi salam was sent to this nation, to the nation of Ad, who lived in the area of Ahqaf, the sand dunes in Yemen. So now what was the crime of this nation? The people of Ad were physically well-built and renowned for their craftsmanship, especially in the construction of tall buildings with lofty towers. And this made them very arrogant, subhanAllah. And that's when they started to worship idols. Now, one thing important to note is that this nation did not reject Allah or did not refused to worship Allah. Rather, they did worship Allah and along with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they worshipped idols. And this is something similar to what the people of Mecca did at the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa So they were reprimanded and Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa was sent to guide them. So Hud alayhi salam reminded them to shun idol worship and la learn from the example of nation of Nuh, learn from the example of their ancestors who recently were destroyed as a result of their abstinence. But the nation of Ad persisted in their sinful activity. They persisted and continued to harass their prophet, ridicule him, mock him. And that's when the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala came upon them. What was the punishment? A huge storm, similar to a tornado, continued to go on in that area for seven nights and eight days, and it completely destroyed them. Imagine if a tornado just comes and hits a city for a few minutes, subhanAllah, it's devastating, it's catastrophic. And yet this tornado went on for seven nights and eight days. So definitely it was a complete destruction and annihilation. And this was something that they brought to themselves by rejecting their prophet. So Hud alayhi salam and the sincere believers who accepted Islam, they migrated to Hadramat and settled over there. And in terms of the lifespan, there's a difference of opinion, but it's mentioned by historians that Hud alayhi salam lived for almost 150 years. SubhanAllah. So that is the legacy of Hud alayhi salam. Hopefully, inshallah, each time we come across his story in the Quran after Ramadan, whenever we recite the Quran, inshallah, we can have a better view of him and his story. So now, last passage mentions to us about the purpose of our creation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions to us, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ I did not create jinn and humans except to worship me. Meaning we were not sent to this world to enjoy, have fun, and then die. We came with a purpose. 
And only when we fulfill that purpose of being a vice student of Allah, being a khalifa of Allah, then only we can access Jannah. And this purpose of life is the same for the jinns and humans. SubhanAllah. So in Jannah, also interestingly, we will be together with the jinns. So SubhanAllah, it's going to be a very interesting place to live, inshallah. So that brings us to the conclusion of Surah Dariyat and the main theme of this surah is highlighted over here. Next, we move on to Surah Tur and Surah Tur, the timeline of the surah is the same as Surah Zariyat. Basically, um, it was revealed in the early Makkan phase. So in this surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes an oath by the mountain of Tur. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَالطُّور وَكِتَابٍ مَسْتُورٍ by the mount and a book inscribed in a published scroll and the frequented house and the elevated roof and the seeding sea. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes an oath by the mountain of Thur. So what is this mountain? This is the mount of Sinai near the place where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke to Musa alayhi salam. And in this passage, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala swears by the original copy of Qur'an, that's in Lawh al-Mahfuz. He also swears by Bayt al-Ma'mur. What is that? It is basically a prototype of Kaaba, which is the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala located in the highest heavens. So just like multiple Muslims perform tawaf around the Kaaba in dunya today, there are 70,000 angels that visit Bayt al-Ma'mur every single day and glorify Allah and worship Allah. So over here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes an oath by that and the elevated roof, meaning the heavens, the sky, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promises by that. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is taking all these oaths by different things to emphasize that the punishment of Allah is haqq. The punishment of Allah is true for those who reject resurrection, for those who harass their prophets. So as Muslims, we shouldn't live a life of heedlessness because if we do so, then we may become a target of the same punishment with which the disbelievers of Mecca are being warned with. But if we do abide by this book, then what's the reward? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions to us about the banquets of Jannah, that for those who fulfill their promise to Allah, who fulfill the covenant of Allah, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make them enter into the gardens of Jannah. So basically a beautiful imagery has been sketched out to us of the amenities of Jannah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that these people will be given delicious food, comfortable recliners, beautiful servants to serve them 24-7, and they will have everything what they desire. But the most striking part of this passage is the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَاتَّبَعَتْهُمْ ذُرِّيَّتَهُمْ بِإِيمَانٍ أَلْحَقْنَا بِهِمْ ذُرِّيَّتَهُمْ وَمَا أَلَتْنَاهُمْ مِنْ عَمَلِهِمْ مِنْ شَيْءٍ that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will unite every person with their family members. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will unite children with their parents in Jannah. And this is from the rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that whoever died on faith, Think about that joy when you meet your long deceased mother after a long time, your long gone grandparents after centuries. How would that reunion look like? SubhanAllah, it's definitely going to be a pleasuresome sight. Allahumma ja'ala minhum. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala include us in this promise so that when we get together, what is our conversation going to be like? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala highlights that to us as well. That we're going to say to each other, Inna kunna qablu fi ahlina mushfiqeen. Remember when we used to meet each other in Quran study sessions, in the masjid, in ICM, subhanAllah, when we used to have those halaqat. Remember in Ramadan, in Jum'ah, how fearful we used to be when the ayat regarding Jahannam were mentioned. Remember the times when we would stand in Taraweeh weeping while listening to the Quran. 
And then, فَمَنَّ اللَّهُ عَلَيْنَا وَبَقَانَ عَذَابَ السَّمُونَ Alhamdulillah, what a huge favor of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that now we're saved from the torment of hell. Alhamdulillah, whatever tears that we shed back then, how much worry we had back then for Jahannam. We sought refuge and we cried and we entered Jannah, we prepared for it. Alhamdulillah, all those efforts were worth it. Subhanallah. So those are going to be the conversations amongst the inhabitants of Jannah. And it's mentioned that our mother, Aisha radiallahu anha, when she would go through this passage about the conversation that would take place of Jannah, especially this passage that's mentioned in Surah Tur, she would cry profusely and she would keep on reciting this ayah over and over again while weeping hoping to receive Jannah, hoping to have this conversation in Jannah, subhanAllah. If that's something that was done by our mother, Aisha radiallahu anha, who's guaranteed Jannah, then what about us? SubhanAllah, we should definitely make dua that we all get together in Jannah and have these beautiful conversations in Jannah. Allahumma amin. So next passage, ayah 49 till 50, um, the time when the surah was revealed, the Prophet wasallam was going through a lot of accusations. So for instance, the people would call him a madman, a poet, a sorcerer. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala basically consoles the Prophet wasallam in this concluding passage that Allah is watching you all the time. So endure every hardship with patience and keep inviting the non-believers to Islam despite their aggression, despite their hostility, and soon the matter will be settled. And this is an advice for all of us that if we wish to yearn the banquets of Jannah, if we wish to seek the gatherings of Jannah, then what is the access code? It is Quran and its application. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide all of us. So next we move on to Surah Najm. This surah is named after an oath that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes by the star. An-Najm wa-Najmi idha hawa ma dalla sahibukum wa ma gawa. By the star as it goes down, your friend has not gone astray, nor has he erred, nor does he speak out of desire. It is in fact but a revelation that is revealed. Talk to him by the extremely powerful. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes an oath by the najm, by the star, to say that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is not a madman, nor is he suffering from any kind of psychological disorder. Whatever he says from the Qur'an is haq. It's based upon divine guidance. So when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam basically recited this surah after a batch of Muslims migrated from Mecca to Abyssinia in order to protect themselves against the torture and persecution. That's when this surah was revealed to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when he was in Mecca. And when he recited the surah in front of the disbelievers of Mecca, at the end, when he recited the verse requiring the performance of Sajda Tilawa, his voice was so powerful. The recitation of this surah was so powerful that the people of Mecca, the disbelievers of Mecca, they all fell down in prostration. Even the chiefs who were in the forefront of opposition, they all prostrated, listening to the Qur'an. This was the power of Qur'an that moved them to such an action. But unfortunately, we are a people whose hearts have hardened. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us. Ameen. So in the next passage, from ayah 7 till 18, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions to us about the miraculous journey of Isra wal Mi'raj. So when we covered Surah Bani Israel or Surah Isra, we mentioned the fact that the first part of this journey the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam rode on an animal Buraq from Mecca to Jerusalem where he led 124,000 prophets in Salah in Masjid Al-Aqsa. 
So this was the first phase of his journey. And then after the phase of Isra, the Prophet ﷺ traveled from Jerusalem all the way to the seven heavens. And this journey is known as Mi'raj. So this part of the journey is highlighted over here. The part when the Prophet ﷺ ascended to the seven heavens, this was the journey when he saw Jibreel ﷺ in his true angelic form. This was the time when he spoke to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala one on one. This was the time when the gift of salah was given to him. This was the time when he spoke to many prophets as he ascended from one heaven to the other. This was the time when the Prophet wasallam actually went through a sneak peek of Jannah and Jahannam. So it was indeed a miraculous journey because he saw what was definitely not possible for any human being to see. But this was something that was shown exclusively to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with the idhan of Allah. However, many times there's this question that did the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam see Allah during this journey? And the answer to that is no, because a companion of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asked our mother Aisha radiallahu anha this question. That did the Prophet وسلم, see Allah during the journey of Isra wal Mi'raj? And she said, how could he see him when there was only light? So meaning there is a veil between us and Allah. But that veil is going to be removed in Jannah. And that is a special gift reserved for Jannah and for the inhabitants of Jannah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us this beautiful opportunity to see Allah, to speak to Allah, to meet Allah, insha'Allah. So in ayah number 32, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes the believers that they are those who avoid sins and stay away from indecencies, except for the minor mishaps that happen accidentally. They are forgiven. So the beauty of this ayah is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us that no matter what level of piety we reach, we should never fall into self-admiration, where we assume that we are the chosen people of Allah. The entire Muslim ummah are, are sinners, and subhanAllah, because of the knowledge I have, because of the good deeds that I do, I am better than all of them. This kind of pride is dangerous for our spiritual health. Why is that so? Because this is the very same disease of pride and arrogance that led shaitan towards his doom. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect all of us. In the next passage from ayah 49 till 62, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala highlights to us the fact that no one deserves to be worshipped other than Allah. And why is this mentioned? Because there was a star by the name of Sirius, which was worshipped at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala mentions over here that Allah is the creator of this star. He is the one who deserves to be worshipped, not any star, not any deity, not any person. And those people who went against the true teachings of Tawheed, they were destroyed like the nation of Ad, or Thamud, or the people of Nuh. So this is a strong warning given to people that no one else can be worshipped other than Allah. When it comes to stars, subhanAllah, there is a study of stars that is permissible in Islam, and a study of stars that is impermissible. So astronomy, studying about stars, is permissible in Islam because when we reflect over the creation of Allah, over the galaxies, the planets, it actually connects us to Allah. So astronomy and studying it is permissible, whereas studying astrology, meaning studying stars, the movement of stars, and believing that the movement of stars have an impact on our future, that's something which is impermissible. So we shouldn't believe in such things that 
have a notion of predicting our future because some people actually do that. And the way they do that is by contacting the jinn. So that's completely haram. Palm reading or going through our zodiac signs and studying about our horoscopes, all this is completely haram. The Prophet ﷺ said, whoever goes to a fortune teller and asks him about something of the future, his prayer will not be accepted for 40 nights. Imagine standing for two hours almost every single day in Ramadan, praying salah, and all that is not even accepted. Not just one day, but 40 days, 40 nights. That is definitely, subhanAllah, very painful. That is definitely a loss. So let's try to protect ourselves from all those deeds that can destroy our hasanat. So over here, um, at the conclusion of Surat Najm, I have just created this mind map of the journey of Isra wal Mi'raj. Why is it important for us to know? Because this incident definitely has a lot of significance in our hearts as Muslims, because lots of miraculous things happened in that journey. And it's our belief in Ilm al Ghaib that we accept this incident being reality and not a dream. So this is something that was exclusively given to the Prophet وسلم, as a gift from Allah. Next, we move on to Surah Qamar. Qamar literally means moon. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts of the surah by saying, So the incident of Shaq al Qamar, splitting of the moon, has been mentioned over here. And that determines its period of revelation precisely because um, the commentators have agreed that this incident took place at Mina when the Prophet ﷺ was still in Mecca, meaning five years before the Prophet ﷺ's migration to Medina. So what actually happened was that when the Prophet ﷺ would invite the disbelievers of Mecca to Islam, they kept asking Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to show them a miracle, a live miracle. And they would say, if you show us a miracle, then that would basically be a hujjah upon us that, yes, you are a prophet. You are not lying. So if that happens, we're going to believe in you. So upon the request, the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made dua to Allah and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala caused this miracle to happen that the moon was split into half such that the Sahaba say that we could actually see the moon split into half between a mountain. So one part of the moon was on this side of the mountain and the other side of the moon was on the other side of the mountain. SubhanAllah. Muslims, non-Muslims, everyone around the world witnessed this. And why did this happen? Because of their request. But once their request was granted, what happened? the people turned away by saying that, wow, we are indeed a great magician. This is very good magic indeed. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaches us that when the hearts become rusted with sins, then hidayah doesn't penetrate through it. No matter how many miracles they see, how many huge signs they witness, they're not going to believe. They're not going to believe. So from ayah 9 till 46, subhanAllah, the whole passage mentions to us about different nations, how were they destroyed. And in this passage, in this surah, there is a repetition of the ayah, So how was my punishment and how was my warning? Indeed, we have made the Qur'an easy for you to remember. So, will you take heed? So many a times, um, we think to ourselves, why is this mentioned? Why is this mentioned in the Qur'an? That indeed Allah has made Qur'an easy for us. The fact of the matter is that many a time we start a Qur'an study, whether it's the science of tajweed or... Uh, a tafsir course or grammar, Quranic grammar, many times we start with a lot of zealousness, with a lot of spirit, enthusiasm. But once 
we are done with few classes, we lose that spirit. We find it overwhelming. We find it difficult and we stop the study altogether. SubhanAllah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promises us that it's indeed easy for us to learn and understand. All it needs is a yearning heart. And when we approach this book with this kind of sincerity, with this kind of zeal, then the book becomes a treasure for us. The more we yearn to read it, and the more we read it, the more it offers to us. The more we learn and the more we excel. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us all. So if we want to zoom into Surah Qamar, subhanAllah, we want to highlight the fact that it wasn't just the splitting of the moon that was given to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam as a miracle. There were, in fact, other miracles as well that were given to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, such as the Holy Quran. This is the biggest miracle of all because of the eloquence, the Arabic, subhanAllah. It's so powerful that even the best influential accredited poets at that time in Mecca agreed about the eloquence of Quran. No one was able to match the eloquence of Quran. So that is the biggest miracle of all. Other than that, we see that inanimate objects spoke to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam with the Idhan of Allah, such as the tree who cried for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because it missed him. Also, the camel who complained to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam about his master who was mistreating him. Also, we come to know about the journey of Isra wal Mi'raj. The entire journey is a miracle, and the incidents that took place throughout the journey is a miracle. Also, we come to know that there were instances when there was actual barakah of food. So, in the wedding of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam with Zainab bin Jahash, we come to know that when Sahabiya Rumaysa radiallahu anha, she sent some food, for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and that food was sufficient just for two people. But there was so much barakah of food that subhanAllah, guests upon guests came to the wedding of the Prophet Sallallahu They ate and they went. They ate and they went and the food, subhanAllah, was still there. It wasn't depleting. So this was the special barakah that happened at the time of the wedding of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, also at the time of the Battle of Trench. Subhanallah. Also, we come to know that during the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, when the people, when the Sahaba were very thirsty due to hot weather, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala caused the miracle of water flowing from the hands of the water, uh, from the hands of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, such that the people were able to do wudu for salah and they were able to quench their thirst, subhanallah. And also we find instances where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was able to cure the sick. Like Ali radiallahu and once he had a very serious eye infection, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa pat his eye, rubbed his hand over his eye and made dua for him and he was cured, subhanAllah. So when it comes to miracles, subhanAllah, there are multiple miracles that were given to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and indeed multiple miracles were given to all the prophets. What's the wisdom behind it? So that a hujjah can be established that they are truly messengers of Allah. Next, we move on to Surah Rahman. And Surah Rahman is named after the sift of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is Rahmah, that he is the most compassionate. So Rahman comes from the root Rahim which means womb of a mother, because the baby is taken care of in this place, in the womb of the mother, in every way. So basically, when we think about this relationship, when a mother is expecting a child, there is a special bond between the baby and the mother. The child isn't really having any emotions for the mother yet, but the mother is in love with the child. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is basically telling us over here in the surah that he is compassionate towards us more than a mother. He is extremely caring towards us more than any mother could be for her child. 
And just like a mother wants the utmost good for her child, just like that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants the best for all of us. So in this surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts off the initial passage with Ar-Rahman, Allama al-Qur'an, Khalaq al-Insan, Allama al-Bayan. Meaning different blessings are highlighted for us. That all these blessings are a gift upon us. Even though we disobey him, he continues to bestow upon us. How many supplications he answers, even though we continue to pursue ingratitude. How many virtues he magnifies for us, even though we hardly put in any efforts. SubhanAllah, so this is Ar-Rahman. This is who Allah is. So this surah is named after the most beautiful names of Allah, Ar-Rahman. And this is Sirat al-Mubalagha because it has a connotation of intensity. So as we go on with the surah, subhanAllah, there is a repetition where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions to us about different blessings that he has given to us. And then there is a repetition of, So which of your Lord's favors will you deny? Meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us of the blessing of day and night, the blessing of living on earth, the blessing of having food and water, different blessings that are around us, but we take them for granted. At least the jinns are better than us because we come to know from a prophetic hadith that when the Prophet ﷺ recited this surah to the jinns, when they came upon this ayah, they responded by saying, None of your favors do we deny our Rabb, all praise is to you, subhanAllah. So in terms of getting a lesson, life lesson from the jinns, subhanAllah, this is something we need to follow from them because we do trivialize our blessings and we do complain a lot. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us over and over again about these different blessings so that we can be grateful for them. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala highlights to us that a person who is grateful to Allah for the blessings and he lives his life with taqwa, fear of Allah, then for him is the reward in Jannah. What is the reward? He will be blessed with two gardens. The person who fears standing in front of his Rabb on the day of Qiyamah and he prepares for that ultimate day, the ultimate standing for him is a huge reward. So now I know that we're having a time crunch, but subhanAllah, I just cannot stop myself not to share the story with you. SubhanAllah, regarding this ayah, we come to know that in the time of Umar radiallahu an, when he was a khalifa, there was a young boy who was a student of Umar radiallahu an. And subhanAllah, he was a very pious individual. So during the daytime, he would spend his time in the masjid studying with Umar radiallahu an, studying the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the Quran. And in the nighttime, he would take care of his sick father, old father. So what happened, subhanAllah, as this person was young and subhanAllah good looking and in his youth ages, when he was coming from the masjid to his house, on the way there was a woman who tried to seduce him. So we can see whenever a person tries to follow the path of Allah, there's always shaitan standing to distract you from Islam, distract you from halal and take you towards haram so this woman continued to invite him towards zina towards lust towards the fulfillment of desire such that one day he finally agreed so he followed her to her house and then as soon as he entered her house something happened and he fell unconscious and subhanAllah, the, the person passed out, so the woman doesn't know what to do. So she carries him to his house. So basically, his elderly father, he, he takes him into the house, he makes dua for him, and subhanAllah, after a long time, he wakes up 
he regains consciousness. So the father asks him, oh, my son, what, what happened to you? And the son replied that, subhanAllah, this is what happened. And I was about to commit this sin. But subhanAllah, as I entered her house, I just remembered this ayah. I had this immense hope, fear of Allah such that I wasn't able to even take one step towards that sin. I felt no inclination towards that woman. And I passed out because of that immense trauma. And subhanAllah, as he was speaking, he passed out again, out of fear. He became unconscious again. But this time, he became unconscious for good because he died. He passed away. So subhanAllah, the next day, there was this huge janazah. So many people participated in his janazah. Umar radiallahu an himself went to his grave, dug his grave, placed his body inside the grave, and he recited this ayah, And he cried and cried as he was reciting this ayah, and a miracle took place, subhanAllah. As he was reciting this ayah, a voice came out from the grave. Whose voice was it? This young boy, subhanAllah, who just died, he responded to Umar from inside the grave, and he said, Ya Umar, Allah has given me two gardens plus a third one along with them. That's it. SubhanAllah. The boy was dead. Yet, a miracle happened in the lifetime of Umar radiallahu an, where the boy himself acknowledged the blessing of Allah. That indeed, truly, who live their lives upon the fear of Allah, trying to please Allah, in the quest of pleasing Allah, then they definitely will be rewarded. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept our humble efforts and enable us to enter the beautiful Jannah that has been promised for the believers in the Quran. So from ayah 50 till 78, a beautiful passage of Jannah is given to us where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions to us about the mansions of Jannah, the fountains of Jannah, the fruits of Jannah, the spouses of Jannah, such that people will be reclining on their cushions, enjoying themselves, eating, drinking, and enjoying the social life of Jannah. So basically, how much conscious they were in dunya not to eat any haram, not to approach any haram. In Jannah, they will be rewarded by living a carefree life, subhanAllah, simply enjoying themselves and not having the slightest worry in their heart or mind. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the amenities of Jannah. Allahumma ameen. So that brings us to the conclusion of this surah, Surah Rahman. Basically, the action point to learn from this surah is that if we wish to access the gardens of Jannah, the amenities of Jannah, what's the password? Fear Allah and have Allah. So with that said, we move on to Surah Waqi'ah. And this surah takes its name from the word al waqiah that is mentioned in the first ayah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِذَا وَقَعَتِ الْوَاقِعَةِ لَيْسَ لِوَقَعَتِهَا كَاذِبَةِ This surah, subhanAllah, is a Makki surah. So this was revealed before Surah Taha. So both these surahs, Surah Waqiyah and Surah Rahman, carries a lot of importance in the hearts of Muslims. And many of us actually recite these two surahs very often to the point that we have always uh, we have already memorized these surahs. And subhanAllah, when we do a deep study of these surahs, these surahs carry a lot of hope. SubhanAllah, in terms of the rewards that are given to the believers that are mentioned and highlighted in these two surahs, that gives us a lot of hope. In fact, Surah Rahman was the first surah that was recited by a, by a sahabi, Abdullah ibn Abbas, um, sorry, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu an, in Mecca publicly. So this was the first surah that was ever recited publicly to the non-believers right in front of Kaaba. And of course, the result of it was catastrophic because all the people came running to beat Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, torment him, throw shoes at him, subhanAllah. 
to the point that he fell unconscious. That was the level of that beating. But subhanAllah, the power of Quran and the level of his iman that when he regained consciousness, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anh asked the Prophet if he is allowed to do the same thing again tomorrow. SubhanAllah. That he wanted to recite Surat Rahman to them. He wanted to introduce the Rahmah of Allah to them. He wanted to invite them to the gardens of Jannah. SubhanAllah. So these are the Sahaba. And SubhanAllah, there is so much to learn from them. So Surat Waqi'ah mentions to us about three groups of people. Sabiqoon al avvalun who are basically the best elite class of Jannah. Then Ashabul Yameen, who are a level lower than them. And then Ashabu Shiman, the people who lost the race and they doomed in hellfire. So let's take a quick sneak peek over these three groups. So from ayah 11 till 26, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions to us about the elite VIPs of Jannah. That there are going to be in the garden of bliss. We're gonna, where they're going to be having furnishings specially customed, custom made for them. And they're going to be reclining on them, facing each other. And they will be served with good looking, handsome youth. Subhanallah, who will be on the quest of serving them. Serving them alcohol, wine, intoxicants that are not going to give them any intoxication. Rather, it's just going to give them pleasure. SubhanAllah. And they're going to have spouse that, SubhanAllah, are going to be as beautiful as pearls. So that indeed is going to be a very elite VIP class. And subhanAllah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions to us that amongst the earlier generation, there are a lot of them, but amongst the latter generation, there are a small number of them. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to include us amongst the small band of Muslims who can accomplish the elite VIP class of Jannah. Allahumma ta'ala minhum. So then we go on to the gold pass holders of Jannah. So subhanAllah, their reward is not going to be that elite compared to the class that we spoke about before. But of course, it's Jannah after all. So of course, they're going to have water, fountains, fruits, beautiful mansions, houses, and beautiful spouses. So in this group, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says there are multitudes of people from the earlier generations as well as the later generations. And then, of course, we seek the refuge of Allah from Jahannam. That, Ya Allah, do not make us be from the third group. What is the third group? The wretched ones who are going to end up in hellfire. Ya Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we ask you to protect us from this loss, from this pain and agony of Jahannam. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes to us that for the people of Jahannam, their food is going to be the fruits of the tree of Zaqum, which is going to melt their bellies. Their, subhanAllah, drink is going to be boiling water, which is going to melt their throats and burn them. Yet, because of the hunger, agony, and thirst of that place, people will be forced to eat this food because they will have no other option. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us from Jahannam. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us Jannah. So in ayah number 74 till 80, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions about Quran, how important it is because indeed it is the access code to Jannah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, it is a noble Quran in a well-protected book. No one can grasp it except the purified. So basically, this is talking about the Quran in Lawh al-Mahfuz because this is the Quran which is only accessed by the ones who are pure. Who are they? They are the angels. So this is a very noble book. This is a very special book. And this is the same book which the angels touch. Me and you have an access to it. 
This is the same book that we hold in our hands every single day. So let's ask ourselves, how much do I value this Quran? How much do I appreciate this Quran and spend time with it? Because when I reach the end of life, this Quran is going to be my only companion who's going to accompany me in my grave. So either the Quran can testify for me or against me. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us from an evil ending. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us the company of Sabiqoon al awwalun so that we are included amongst the elite VIP class of Jannah or at least we expect to be from the gold pass holders of Jannah, but not the third group. May Allah protect us from Jahannam. So these are the three groups that are mentioned in Surah Tabaqi'ah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala unite all of us in Jannatul Firdaus. Last, we come to the last surah of this juz, which is Surah Hadid. And this is the only Madani surah in this juz. And this was revealed during the interval between the Battle of Uhud and the Truce of Hudaybiyah. So this surah starts off with Sabbaha, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Sabbaha lillahi ma fi samawati wal ard wa huwa al aziz al hakim. So all the surahs that start from Sabbaha, they are known as the Musabbihat. And it was the norm of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa to recite all the Musabbihat before going to bed. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, whatever is in the heavens and the earth glorifies Allah. Shouldn't we glorify Allah as well? So in the next passage, ayah 10 to 11, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions to us the different ranks of sahaba based upon their sacrifices. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, those who spend in the cause of Islam before the conquest of Mecca are on a higher level of iman in comparison to those who accepted Islam after the conquest of Mecca. Why is that so? Because the people who initially accepted Islam when Islam was weak, went through a lot of persecution, went through a lot of agony, went through a lot of trials, such that, that they had to leave their homes, their wealth, their family members in Mecca and migrate to Medina in order to save themselves from the persecution. So indeed, they went through a lot of struggle. So their reward is higher compared to the people who entered the fold of Islam during its golden era because... They didn't have to make all those sacrifices that the earlier generation did. So what's the lesson for us? That when we are given an opportunity to do good deeds, the question is, do I perform that good deed when it's needed the most? Or do I procrastinate and perform them after everyone has already done it? So whether it's a fundraiser, whether it's someone coming to my doorstep asking me for help, whether it's teaching my own children about the essentials of Islam, whether it's helping out in the masjid, volunteering with the task, the question is, am I sabiqoon al-awwaloon in terms of earning good deeds? Am I earnest to seek the opportunity as soon as it's presented to me? Because if we want to be from the elite class of Jannah, then I need to be sabiqoon al awwalun in terms of the performance of those good deeds as well. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide all of us. So the next passage, a grappling image is given to us regarding the bridge of Sirat. So this will be the time when the disbelievers would have already been sent to Jahannam. And now the only group that's left is the one who proclaimed their faith wholeheartedly, meaning the sincere Muslims, and the ones who pretended to have faith. They will be asked to cross the bridge of Sirat, just these two groups. And this would be the final test that would determine their destiny. And the way how this bridge is located, it's going to be located on the day of Qiyana, is that it is going to be situated right on top of Jahannam. So each person who's able to cross the bridge reaches Jannah. But whoever is not able to cross this bridge, 
Then he tips down and falls into the blazing fire of Jahannam. Because as mentioned by the Prophet wasallam, this bridge is thinner than a hair and sharper than a sword. So it's definitely a testing situation that the people are going to face on the day of Qiyamah. And because it's going to be pitch darkness, the only way people will be able to cross this bridge is by having nur with them. If they have the light of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if they have this nur accompanying them, then only they will be able to pass this bridge and enter Jannah. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa mentioned to us that each person is given a light. Some people have a lot of light with them. So they will zoom through this bridge at the speed of light. Whereas some will have their light flickering, switching on and off. So they will be crawling. It will take them an extensive long time to make it to Jannah which is all the way on the other side of the bridge. And there will be some who will have no light at all. Who are they? The hypocrites. So they will call out to the believers, saying that, oh my friends, didn't we live amongst you? Didn't we socialize with you? We used to hang out with each other every single day. We used to have fun with each other. What happened to you? Why have you forgotten us today? Please give us some of your light so that we're able to walk with the help of your light. And that's when they will be told, you deceived yourself in this world by cheating, lying, and faking Islam. So there is no refuge for you today. There is no escape for you today. And a barrier will be placed between them and they will fall down in the pit of hellfire. So these ayat presents to us three groups of people. The ones who make it to Jannah very fast, while some who eventually reach Jannah after a period of long struggle and exhaustion, and then a group who falls down in the pit of Jahannam because they faked Islam while they were in the new. So the question is, why are some people able to pass the bridge at the speed of light while there are some whose light is flickering for them? Because this light, which is given on the day of Qiyamah, is highly dependent on the light of Iman that they followed in the new. Meaning, when Ramadan approached, Every person of their household was busy reciting Qur'an, indulging in late-night taraweeh. Iman was high. And then when Ramadan was over, they still kept engaging themselves with the Qur'an. They were never negligent about their five daily salawat. They continued to keep their covenant with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So for them is the promise that they will be given a lot of light and they will pass the bridge of Sarat at the speed of light. Whereas some who are just Jum'ah Muslim, such that they pray only on the day of Jum'ah, or they are categorized by being Ramadan Muslims, such that they only worship Allah in the month of Ramadan, then for them, their light will be flickering because the level of their Iman used to switch on and off while they were in dunya. So what are we being taught in the Qur'an? That we have to strive to be steadfast in terms of our iman. Yes, we all go through highs and lows. Yes, our level of iman isn't the same after Ramadan. We do go through post-Ramadan blues, but as believers, we should never compromise on our obligations. We should always be honest in our dealings. We should always try our best to fulfill the haq of Allah and the haq of people upon us because we will be questioned about huququllah and huququl ibad. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive our shortcomings and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide all of us such that we're able to rejoice on the day of Qiyam. So in ayah 16 till 19, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Isn't it time 
And basically, it's a rhetorical question that isn't it time for those who believe to surrender themselves to Allah? Isn't it time? And this question is for you and me. Let's ask ourselves, what are we waiting for? Ramadan is here. We're already witnessing the last 10 nights of Ramadan. What more can we ask? Isn't it time that we should seek forgiveness for our sins and submit our will to the will of Allah? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala applauds the charitable men and women to say that not only their spending in the path of Allah will bring them multiple rewards, but as a bonus package, they will be given nur on the bridge of Sirat. So another key element is that a part of making, apart from making sincere tawbah, we should spend in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala graciously as well. If we wish to attain light, attain nur on the day of Qiyamah. So in the next passage, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala presents to us a beautiful snapshot about our entire life. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that the first stage is play. When it's all about playing peekaboo, so the first stage is lab. Next is the stage of lahu, where we want more variety to fun. So things like video games that protect us more, and we want to play with the friends. But as we reach youth age, this is the age of glitter, when our entire focus of life is seeking the attention of people. So then, how do we act? We spend a lot of time on fixing our appearance, seeking praise from others. And that becomes the central motif of our life. But then, life moves, moves on. We get married, we have children, and the focus of life shifts. And what does the focus become then? Boasting over our accomplishments of life. We enjoy self-admiration. And then is a stage of rivalry when competing with others in terms of increasing our real estate or business becomes the sole mission of our life. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this passage summarizes our entire life within a sentence to say that the parable of our life is just like a beautiful vegetation. It's beautiful and lush at one point of time, but eventually it's going to turn yellow and fade away. So yes, just like youth age has its attraction and adulthood has its own joy, as we keep getting older and older, life will definitely get busier and busier to the point that there will be a time where we'll, we'll, we will transition from adulthood to seniorhood. And then we're not going to be green anymore. We're going to become yellow, meaning become weak, and fade away, meaning we're going to die. So life will always be busy for us, no matter what. It's not going to get any less busier than this. So now is the opportunity to do good deeds. Now is the time for us to seriously take this Quran in our lives and to acquaint ourselves with this Quran, to apply this Quran in our lives, because tomorrow we're going to fade away. Death is evading us every single minute. So in actual terms, there is no tomorrow. So let's do it today. Whatever we intend to do in terms of good deeds, whether it's sadaqah, whether it's giving charity, whether it's initiating salam, whether it's helping out a poor, whether it's helping our Muslim brothers and sisters in Gaza by donating money, whatever we intend to do in terms of good deeds, let's do it right now. Because the reality of this worldly life is that eventually it is going to pass and we're all going to die. So every single day, we are basically going near our death. So every single day, we should prepare for the final day of judgment. So how do we prepare for it? Because the highlight of this surah was attaining nur on the day of Qiyamah, when it's going to be pitch dark, let's analyze the different ways how we can attain nur on the day of Qiyamah. Because when it comes to physical beauty, as women, we all like to be beautiful. 
We want to have fair skin, nice toned body, colored eyes. But the question is, do we wish to attain noor such that our faces are shining radiantly on the day of Qiyamah? Such that all the people are able to recognize us with the shine on our face, with the beauty that we have on that day? And the answer to that is yes. Who amongst us wouldn't want to have that? And that day, the beauty is going to be given to people through nur. And how do we attain this nur? There are different ahadith of the Prophet Sallallahu where we are given the special vouchers, special ways to attain this nur. So what do we do? For instance, we come to know from a prophetic hadith that we should make dua for nur. So we should say, Allahumma ja'al fi qalbi nura, wa fi lisani nura, wa fi sam'i nura. We should make this dua on a daily basis. Also, the recitation of Quran and dhikr brings nur to our bodies on the day of Qiyamah. Reciting Surah Al-Kahf on Friday and praying five times salah every single day, it is going to bring nur. What else? Walking to the masjid in darkness and perfecting our wudu in the most coldest of days. That is going to bring us nur on the day of Qiyamah. What else? Loving each other for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Amongst the servants of Allah or people who are neither prophets nor martyrs, but whom the prophets and martyrs will deem fortunate because of their high status with Allah. Who are they? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, They are people who loved each other for the light of Allah, for the sake of Allah without being related to one another as being tied to one another by lineage. Their faces are going to be lit and they will be upon chairs of light. They will have no fear when the people will have fear on the day of Qiyamah and they will have no grief when the people will be grieving on the day of Qiyamah. And then he recited the following verse, Behold, on the friends of Allah, there shall be no khawf and no huzn. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to enhance this love that each one of us share with each other purely for the sake of Allah because we come to this class every single day, dedicate our time, one hour at least for the sake of Allah every single day. And this love that is there, that we feel for each other. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always keep it for the sake of Allah, purely and sincerely, such that this love leads us to attain the love of Allah in Jannah, such that this love leads us to attaining nur on the bridge of Sarat. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep us all sincere for the sake of Allah, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Grant all of us his pleasure on the day of judgment. Ameen ya Rab. With that said, we will conclude our session for today. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Nashhadu an la ilaha illa ant. Nastaghfiruka, nastaghfiruka, ba natubu ilayk. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana, wa fi al-akhirati hasana, wa qina adhaab al-nar. Allahumma anis wahshati fi qabri. Allahumma arhamni bil Quran al-Azim. Waj'alhu li imama wa nura wa huda wa rahma. Allahumma dhakkini minhu ma nasit, wa allimni minhu ma jahilt. Wa rizuqni tilawatahu ana al-layli wa ana al-nahar. Waj'alhu li hujjatan ya rabbal alameen. Ameen summa ameen. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhum.